have a story to tell about a powerful woman uh, that God graced us to know, to learn from, to watch, to be challenged by. Andrea and I went to kindergarten together, okay? Elementary school, high school. She didn't come out of poverty like I did. Um, her mother was an educator and her father was a doctor, a dentist in our community. Uh, so she never wanted for some of the things that many of us were deprived of just because of our circumstance. Um, and unlike many others that came up in a middle, middle class uh, situation, uh, it didn't make her a person of arrogance or indifference. Even though she came from a middle class uh, uh, family, she was a regular sister, always in the neighborhood. She was one of the girls. She was one of the, you know, one of the folks uh, growing and one of the popular people in high school, not because she was a middle class person, because she was a real person. One of Andrea's cut buddies, as we would say it from old school. Um, and she talked about how they got in and out of stuff. <laughs> as young people, young women, uh, back in our high school days and uh, elementary, middle school days, and how Andrea was right there hanging and always was part of the group, you know. So she was a free, uh, well-rounded, very confident, and also very talented individual. Um, she was always a leader in terms of the academic societies. Um, the spelling contests at school, early years when we started, she was just an outstanding, intellectually gifted, well-rounded, grounded, free person. And she carried that into her later life and uh, professional life. And I think that's part of what we saw as we saw her moving because Andrea was, you know, she felt like she belonged. She was, you know, she, she, she didn't feel like she was intellectually inferior. She had come out of uh, Negro wealth, if you will, so she didn't feel like she, she wasn't a poor person. You know, she could have had, she had a car when we didn't have a car. You know, she had nice clothes, she had traveled, she had been cultured. Andrea was an excellent piano player as a young child. She had, you know, and we only had one private kindergarten for black folk in our whole town when we grew up. Well, she, you know, she was expected to go to that private kindergarten because of her upbringing. I don't know how, my grandmother who raised me made a major sacrifice to afford 
for me to go to a private kindergarten. So I was one of those poor kids that's going basically to a kindergarten with more well-to-do kids um, uh, at that time. But uh, I never saw that have any impact on the personality and the person of an Andrea Harris. Wonderful, free person. And I think we saw that in terms of her professional life and the way she would push the envelope. She was free. She really was free, unafraid. She was all about, you know, making sure that we had lots of culture and, you know, museums and you need to know this. We would have arguments at the house that, you know, would always end up in somebody pulling out an encyclopedia to figure out the answer to the question. And, you know, they were just, it was a very scholarly um, household. And she was from the very onset, like a second mom, you know. She and my grandmother both, they are super opinionated. So there is, you know, there's their opinion and there is their opinion. <laughs> And then when two is wrong, see rule number one. <laughs> you know, they had a lot of love between the two, but they were kind of like oil and water to a certain extent. They um, definitely had their heated debates all the time, which was kind of like the, the standard for just being at my grandma's house. You know, my grandma debated with my aunt, you know, and then my aunt debated with my dad, and then the two of them debated with my dad, and then vice versa. It was just always some type of debate going on in the house. So is, they were always in church. So every Sunday we went to church. I remember her coming to get me out of school to march for on Martin Luther King, um, for Martin Luther King's birthday, because it should have been a national holiday and we're not tolerating this anymore. And, you know, and we marched downtown Henderson. And that's honestly my, biggest memory of actually coming in contact with the KKK. Like I remember we walked on the right side of the street down through downtown Henderson on Garnet Street and the KKK were on horses with hoods on and some of them without hoods on walking through the streets like screaming at us. She took us everywhere, um, really everywhere from the nation's capital, I remember. It's all, like all these um, stories, you know, that are they're doing now about the nation's capital and, uh, and everything going on in the world today. I just have these memories of being up there with her. And she kept saying, you guys, all y'all wanna do is go to the pool. I bring y'all to the Smithsonian Institute this and that place and the National and the Washington Monument and the Jefferson Memorial, all these places that she was so impressed with. And we were like, what time are we gonna be back at the pool? Of course, her Bennett College. Say Bennett, Bob. Bennett was sacred for her. Bennett College. Very passionate about Bennett. Bennett College. Bennett College. A Bennett College issue. Bennett. The Bennett Bell to the last chime. When she was at Bennett, she was in that group. You, if you ever talk to any Bennett Bells, they'll tell you. Maybe I think she was in Gladys Robinson, Senator Robinson's class. Uh, and they just raised hell on the campus all the time. <laughs> And uh, for the right reasons, okay. Bennett was a foundation for us. Uh, when we went to school in the mid-60s, late mid-60s, uh, what we learned at Bennett was that we had to be involved in community. We couldn't just stay on campus and learn what was going on but we had to be involved in the community to learn what was going on around us. Because she had done a lot of her maturation at Bennett, um, leaving Henderson, that was where she landed, was at Bennett College. And at a very turbulent time in our country, um, which I know helped to shape the person that she was. Uh, having been in Bennett and Greensboro when the 
uh, Woolworth situation happened and A&T's campus was uh, attacked by the police. <laughs> and then we were there during the turn of Bennett's culture. We felt that a 9 p.m. curfew and, you know, the gloves and hats, but we didn't need the hats. <laughs> so she, she, um, she says that she followed me in terms of sit-ins on campus because we, we slept out at the president's house. Uh, to say, no, we aren't going to do this anymore. We're not going to have a nine o'clock curfew going, <laughs> coming into campus. And, and these things have got to change. So we did change some things. We changed quite a few of the, the policies on campus in terms of curfew and, and hats and that kind of stuff. We still wore a little kerchief, but we weren't going to wear hats and gloves down. We weren't going to do it at that. And we felt that we needed to be outside of the gates. So she, as well as I, went down the street to the Greensboro Association of Poor People, the GAP. And we got involved in what GAP was doing. And GAP was involved in um, helping people who worked in cafeterias and, you know, the, the blue collar worker people who made, I think, 50 cents an hour if they made that much during that time help them to get better wages, because all of them were our people. Uh, and then also garbage workers, we helped with the garbage worker strikes and all of those things that GAP did in terms of raising the standard of living of poor people who were trying to take care of their families but had no way up and there was nobody to help them. Bennett women went to jail. President at the time said, I'm gonna, uh, we'll bring you, we'll ha give you your exams in jail, but you all are here for the right reasons. And so, uh, so she just kind of grew up in that culture. So she got involved in housing. Uh, and during that time, Bennett had all of the old boarded up houses around it, very um, needed really housing development. And uh, had not gotten that kind of money, so she was involved with the whole redevelopment around Bennett. I was teaching a class uh, for Soul City, and I got learned about getting around Warren County. And so I heard about this young, dynamic person who was running a community organization, and that's when I first heard about her. Now, I met her there. I came down to work with Floyd at Soul City, and she came over to Soul City uh, because it was, nothing was there but trailer, but it was the thing. And we just met and, um, you know, just began to talk and, same age and she had a brother so we used to hang together um, but when I first met her I was just shocked I said dang on I didn't expect to find Andrea Harris in Warren County I mean I just did not expect it now that was just my expectation coming from the north being in the country for the first time but um, so we just got to know each other and I thought dang on I need to get her to come to work here I was a day late in asking her to come to work at Soul City, but that worked out well because she was running the Community Action Agency, uh, Franklin Vance Warren Opportunity, Inc. Uh, that covered Franklin Vance Warren counties. They were doing Head Start, summer feeding programs, uh, some stuff with adults. So Andrea was running that, and she was just very interested in even then we were talking about black economic development and she was just interested in it. My father was in that early crowd of community developers in uh, late 1960s, uh, 1970s. And they were talking about the state and how things that need to happen and why we couldn't give up just after the death of Dr. King and the kind of development that needed to happen, particularly in eastern North Carolina, particularly in northeastern North Carolina, in the rural counties where the Black Belt was, they were talking about the power. And I was sitting there as a little kid just watching. 
And in the midst of the, mostly men, I will say, there were a few women, most men, but there was a woman that was in that midst that had the respect of everybody there. She was short, bright skin, short hair, but she was a powerhouse. And she was always thinking about the people. Now, interestingly, she, I learned later in life that she actually ended up working for Governor Holzhauser, who was a Republican, but not the kind of Republicans we see today. He was a different kind of Republican. And he really had an interest. Andrea got involved and pushed that governor and subsequently Democratic governors and others to never forget rural economic development, to never forget minority economic development. She was always talking about in those meetings, we have to have the data. We can't just go in with emotion. We got to have the data. And the data we need is not just what are the needs of our communities, but what our communities provide. She said, we have to have, I remember even then, we have to have a way of saying in, in Harnett County, in Washington County, the African-American economic impact is this. The business impact is this. She said, we must make sure that we have a seat at the paper, not the table, not only because we ought to, but because we pay for it. And we continue to pay for it. She said, for too long, the power, the economic power of the minority black community has been written off. And people think we come to the table simply with our hands out, when in fact, if you look, get the data, you would show that our communities have been at the key and at the foundation of the upholding of the South and the Southern economy. Even, it was certainly during slavery, it's been so even after slavery. And I can remember she would be there late into the night. Sometimes those meetings would go on till three in the morning. She had so much influence in the community. I mean, my grandmother would always say, Andrea, don't answer the phone, just stop answering the phone. And when she would say, Mama, these people need me. What do you mean? There is no, who else, if I don't do it, who else is gonna do it? And she, grandma would say, I don't know, somebody other than you. Because the phone would ring all hours of the night, all day, all the time with people just in the community who would call and say, you know, she would get up in the morning and say, well, this happened with that person or this person overnight and now we gotta go. And I'm like, who is going and where are you going? You know, but she had her connections and her people. I gotta go talk to the mayor or the city council or they're planning on putting the sewage lines over here again in our neighborhoods. You know, she was always very passionate about um, just our community and making sure that we were on the winning end and that things were not continuing to be the status quo, which was a real problem. And it's still a real problem in North Carolina. Soul City bellied up in 79, um, and I went to work for uh, the state in 1980, in June of 80. I had an opening in 81, I guess I had my first opening. That's when I hired Andrea. I called Andrea, I said, Andrea, I need you to come work for me. And, you know, a number of people were, oh, Lou, why, why'd you get her? What does she know about business? And I said, Lou, I said, this is not about business. I said, what we're doing, you know, this is a struggle. I mean, you ask somebody to give up something that is theirs, that's a struggle. I said, and there are going to be fights, and Andrea has more balls than most men that I know. She's not going to run away, and that's what's needed. Somebody that can, you know, stand in there, take the hit, and keep on going. And Andrea knew how to work the political system, and she was just very good at that because I didn't have that kind of patience for all of that BS. But Andrea just, I mean, she was just unbelievable. My father always said to me, if there's one sister in North Carolina that you want to stay in touch with, it's Andrea Harris. So I don't know if I looked at her kind of like a quasi mother figure in the movement, a uh, mentor or uh, a sister, you know, because uh, she always tell me, don't talk about it. I'm old, I'm not old. <laughs> but what I know is I left the area after college, after being at North Carolina Central, I mean at Duke University, and I went to Martinsville, Virginia. And I was at Martinsville, Virginia, and I was pastoring. And events happened that forced me to have to come back to North Carolina. I had to leave the congregation I was pastoring. 
and uh, come back to North Carolina for family reasons and medical emergency reasons. When I came back to North Carolina, I had an offer to serve part-time as the chaplain at North Carolina Central University, campus minister. But I remember on the, the process of coming back, I get a call. And the call was from Andrea Harris. And she says, listen, she is a Delta now. Y'all got, I mean, that's part of the story. She was a Delta to her heart. She even knew stories about me and the Deltas at school that I didn't know she knew. She came to me one day and said, I heard you stole the Delta line during uh, 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 one of the weeks. And you, you better be glad I wasn't there when you did that. <laughs> but um, she uh, called me and said, uh, Barbara? I said, yes, it was this. She said, this is Andre Harris. I said, hello, Andre, how you doing? She said, well, I really miss your daddy. Our daddy had, had gone on the glory. <clears throat> had gone on the glory then. And when she called me, you know, I, 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 my mind, my soul went to those rooms and I could hear his voice and hear those discussions. And, and I remember what he said, if there's one sister you want to stay in touch with, Felt a little shame because I hadn't stayed in touch with her. But she said, I have an event. The Deltas are sponsoring, and I want you to come speak. And Grant Hill, uh, who was either a player at Duke at the end of his time or had just gone into pros, he was going to be the speaker as well. She said, I know what's in you because I know your daddy. And I want you to come and talk to us about faith. And I want you to talk to us about economic um, justice. And I said, okay. And um, as is the case, what I learned from my father, you don't ever, when certain people call you, say, well, what's the honorarium? <laughs> you go. If, you, if date is free, you go, because they have paid the kind of dues that if they need you, you go. And so uh, I went, and this is in uh, uh, 1992, 93. 93, I think, actually, uh, toward the winter months of 93. And when we got there, like it was with Andrea, it was packed because, you know, she was a consummate organizer. Everybody from that area was seemingly there. And immediately when I came in, she said, this is Barbara's boy. How you doing? She hugged me and she start, certainly started doing the networking. <laughs> this is so-and-so with this bank and this is so-and-so with this community agent. And this is so-and-so who works for this. And this is so-and-so. You need to get to know them now. They work in housing. And, 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 and she just started networking. It's almost as though she was, though we had not seen each other for a while, because of her connection with my father and connection with those old meetings, she said, let me hook you up, you know. And that was, a, you, you hook people up. That's what we call it, call it networking today. But ba back then it was hooking folk up. And if you were in the movement, there were certain people you had to know. You needed to know them because their works demanded that you know them. Many times I'd be in a room and I didn't know she was there and she would come up and tap me on the shoulder and I'd look around and it's Andrea and she'd just be smiling. And uh, I'd say, girl, how you doing? What are you up to now? I know you're up to something. She said, yeah, I want to talk to you. I've got several things I want to talk to you about. And she would have, she would enumerate them right there, right on the spot and say, Bob, I need your help. I want you to do this. I want you to make this call. I want you to go to this meeting with me or something else. Because she was always on it. But I got to know her when uh, she and Lou Myers and Abdul were thinking about putting together an organization, an organization that she called a think tank. Tyronza Richmond was the dean of the business school at Central, the dean of the business school at A&T was involved. So we got those folk involved because, you know, we wanted to do something really serious. But uh, so we set that up and it started out as a think tank. Andrea believed that the Institute need to be associated with the university. She says the university could do two things. One is it would help 
minorities to be competent, to do the work, because it made no sense to go out and get opportunities for people and then not have people who could perform in those places. And then second, and then she thought uh, that the university uh, was a place that could create data and knowledge. Uh, so that's how she had two views about the university and how they could fit in. Lou at the time was assistant secretary, Lou Myers, who's currently the board chair of the Institute, was um, Assistant Secretary of Commerce in North Carolina. And uh, Ms. Harris and some others were really had this idea of how do you continue to provide resources to communities and forget about the black communities in the state budget and the state legislature. And she also focused that and said, you know, we have all these people of color. How do we make sure that we make sure the policies are also at, works in their favor? And um, so she thought around, well, do we get a fair share of economic um, impact from the disbursement of capital from the legislature? Do we get our fair share of opportunities in the public and the private marketplace? And she brought that to Lou's attention, like we need to start studying this information so we can start giving the information to the legislature so they can react responsibly. And I think she spoke with Lou and also at the time, um, Terry Stanford, I don't know if he was um, a senator at the time, and he said, why don't you, don't put this in a university, and why don't you create a nonprofit and focus on that? And, and it came out to be the Institute of Minority Economic Development, and to look at it, a place of higher education and a focus on development and providing information. And later they did provide that kind of information to the legislature to, to show them the impact, the adverse impact of not including diverse organizations in their funding model and how they could be changed if they decide to do that. We incorporated it in 1986 when we got our first funding. And we talked about it because I remember one of our discussions was uh, this ought to be the North Carolina Institute of Black uh, Businesses. Andrea, no, Lou, no, no, it needs to be minority. I said, no, Andrea, it needs to be black business. No, so, you know, we would go through our brother, sister fight, and, and then, you know, but she was right. <laughs> so we started, we got our first funding in 86 from Z. Smith Reynolds. My first involvement with Andrea is when I first met her in sometime in February of 1993. I was a legislative liaison for the Department of Health, Environment, and Natural Resources. And the subcommittee, appropriation subcommittee meetings took place in room 421, legislative office building. So I'm sitting in the meeting and in walks Andrea. I didn't know her. She had on a black pantsuit with a bag over her shoulder that had a big white binder in it. That's how I remember first meeting her. Because she walked in like she owned the place. <laughs> I was brand new, didn't know a thing. She could get to anybody, and the people that she called, and you, you, if she referred them to you, they would take your call, they would take you seriously, and they would not um, put you on the back burner. You can't know Andrea Harris and not have known what an advocate she was for right, for people, and for the whole world. I say whole world because Andrea took a global view to the most local opportunities. And she was a negotiator. She negotiated deals, she negotiated relationships. Basically, she was the glue between a many, many of relationship that exists today for people. She came along when Republican was in control. And they probably looked at Ms. Harris like, who is this little African-American petite woman here telling us what we should do? I'll tell you a funny story. Lenny Springs was at where, well, Lenny Springs was at Wachovia. A lot of people don't know the story. Lenny Springs got there because of Ms. Harris. Wachovia was going through this whole diversity initiative and had to find the right person. And Ms. Harris said, your problem is in your upper executive level, in the C-suite, you have nobody look like me. She went out and she said, I got the right person. Here's his background, here's what he, what he could do. Wycovia hired Lenny. Lenny did very well on the procurement diversity side. Lenny got on the NWACP board. Lenny Springs would tell you, it went for Ms. Harris advocating for him on the C-suite side. His career would be totally different. 
And to me, that's what's so powerful. I can't even remember the first time I met her. I think it was in a big group meeting when there was a lot of finger pointing going on with the old Wachovia, which we learned from and we got better and better until it just was a business that was self-sustaining, but not without Andrea's catalytic powers. She helped me to be better, constantly being better, and helped institutions and organizations be better all the time. Because she could tell you the truth, she'd tell you the truth. And she'd just do it with such love.